Today, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Andy Wood, who's a scientist at the NCAR Research Applications Lab here in Boulder, Colorado. He's one of the leading experts at NCAR in the areas of stream flow forecasting, hydrologic modeling and applications and monitoring and prediction for floods, droughts. He has worked also on climate change, downscaling and impact assessment, water resources management and planning and seasonal climate and hydrologic for forecasting. Andy worked um, in many different sectors. Andy has worked for a couple of years in the US Army Corps of Engineers Institute for Water Resources, focusing on assessment of wetland storage for flood control. And he also worked um, at the University of Washington Department of uh, Civil Engineering as a research professor, focusing on research to improve real-time hydrologic monitoring and prediction systems. After which Andy was a senior and lead scientist of um, a private firm in Seattle, three tier, focusing on forecasting and assessment of hydropower, solar and wind energy. And Andy has spent three years as a development and operations hydro hydrologist with the NOAA National Weather Service River Forecast Center in Salt Lake City. Andy um, has served as a chair and co-chair of many national and international committees. For instance, he has chaired the Hydrology Committee of the American Meteorological Society. He's currently the, an editor of the AMS Journal of Hydrometeorology, and he's also a co-leader of the International Hydrologic Ensemble Prediction Experiment, which seeks to advance the application of ensemble forecasting for water management. And he was formerly the co-leader of the first NOAA MAP Drought Task Force. Thank you, Andy, for accepting our invite. Looking forward to your lecture. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, I will share my screen. And then try to find my presentation. Okay, today I'm going to talk about um, the influence really of the land surface on sub-seasonal to seasonal predictions, um, um, because I think there's an important aspect of the land surface that and its influence and sort of moderation of seasonal prediction skill and the importance of climate forecasts that may be not widely appreciated within the climate, um, climate forecasting and modeling community, particularly global climate forecasting modeling community, um, and yet is has been a concern and a challenge for hydrologists and water managers seeking to make use of S2S forecast and hydrology for a really long time. Um, so I showed a few of these slides when we started up the workshop on last Monday, so some will be familiar. And the first couple of slides are going to be about this role of the land surface versus subseasonal climate predictions. Um, so in particular, when we think about hydrology, and, and particularly the variable that we care about for water management, which is often stream flow, probably predominantly stream flow, um, we have to recognize that that stream flow is generated by processes that are largely in the subsurface or stored on the surface in the form of snow. Um, it's true that in some meteorological events, it's basically raining with such a high intensity that the meteor meteorological drivers of stream flow are dominant and rainfall is running off directly into streams without really delaying within the subsurface. But most of the time, uh, it's kind of a balance. Stream flow, the generation of stream flow is kind of balanced between hydrologic and meteorological influences. So when we look at S2S predictability in hydrology, there are basically two main sources of predictability, one being what we call hydrologically, hydrological or watershed predictability, basically the evolution of snow through snow melt and soil moisture through drainage um, into stream channels that are routed to areas we care about, um, in particular for managing water. And then the other source of predictability is how well we can estimate the drivers of, the, of that um, hydrologic 
variability. So uh, future climate forecasts, future weather forecasts, um, if those have skill, those can be filtered through the land surface to provide stream flow forecast skill. Um, so if we recognize that there are always these two sources of predictability that are potentially active, we find that we have to think a little bit differently about how to make how we want to go about making hydrologic subseasonal predictions. Um, I should just to give a bit of background for those who are more on the climate weather side or perhaps data science side. Um, as I mentioned, hydrologic forecast predictability derives from two major sources. Um, for about the last 40 years, um, the main dynamical based approach for uh, forecasting stream flow or forecasting hydrology at seasonal scales has been called something called ESP, which was originally extended stream flow prediction, later became ensemble stream flow prediction. I actually tracked down the origins of the practice, which began at the California Department of Water Resources, but uh, with the National Weather Service looking over their shoulders from the California Nevada River Forecast Center. So in the mid 70s, they started a practice of basically initializing a watershed model um, deriving it with observed meteorology up to the current date, in which case the watershed model would capture this watershed predictability in the form of snow, the snow component and the soil component, and then driving it forward with historical sequences of climate. So they didn't, at the time, they, there certainly was a lot of research into uh, teleconnections, and some of that was funded by California. Um, as early as the late 50s, um, basically trying to establish connections between sea surface temperatures and, and land climate. Um, but at the time, there were not many developed operational climate forecasts, so historical sequences were used to kind of evolve the watershed conditions forward into the future, uh, recognizing the role of land surface physics and transforming meteorology into future outcomes. Uh, for stream flow, and this practice became known as ESP. Um, and it's still being used all over the world as a, a dominant form of seasonal or subseasonal to seasonal uh, hydrologic prediction. Um, in the, as we get into the last decade or so, the rise of a greater number of climate model-based forecasts and the availability of them and the availability of skill assessments that show that they have benefit has started to change this practice a little bit. But this is still a dominant uh, form of, of forecasting. Um, the most common ways that you would improve hydrologic forecasting focus on basically both the sources of predictability. You either can improve the watershed models or the watershed observations or methods that are used to uh, estimate those conditions, including data assimilation, or you can prove, improve your knowledge about future weather and climate, which would help shrink the uncertainty that you have going forward from this initial condition. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we did to uh, screen is frozen. Um, some work we did to start to understand the interplay between these two sources of predictability. Um, back in around 2004, I had been making a lot of hindcast, ensemble hindcast, and presenting them at conferences. And uh, one morning, yeah, I confess I was getting a little bit tired of just presenting the same material. So I thought about kind of reversing the concept of the ESP forecast and thinking about, so the ESP forecast basically combines a, a, a well-known initial condition with uncertainty in a climate forecast in the future. And I thought, well, what if we look at the role of uncertainty in the initial condition as a contrast um, with a perfect climate forecast in the future? And I called this reverse ESP. And then I realized that if you contrast the skill that you get from these two ways of making a forecast, and of course, this reverse ESP is not a realistic way of making a forecast because you would you don't have in real world the real world that much uncertainty in the initial conditions. Then you can start to understand something about the kind of persistence of uh, forecast signal um, or uncertainty in either one of these components as you go out 
in, in longer forecast lead times. And the reason that this sort of ESP forecast works or that at times this reverse ESP forecast gives you some insights is that in hydrology, we have this, that, this seasonal cycle of storage components. So in, the, in these two graphs over here, I'm showing basically uh, various major source storages of moisture, such as SWE, which is snow or equivalent or snow moisture, and how they vary throughout the calendar year, and then and give rise to runoff, this RO field, at a certain time of year. So in a place like the Rio Grande near Lobatos, which is a heavily snowmelt-driven system, you have a rise of snow in the winter months that melts in the spring, and then it drives a rise in soil moisture and a rise in runoff, which becomes stream flow, is a very seasonal phenomenon. So if you can imagine that if you're looking at predictability in uh, March or April, when these uh, watershed storages and moisture are very high, these are gonna do more to drive uh, the runoff and stream flow signal than precipitation, which is this P sort of shown as, as a seasonal cycle here. Um, and that's completely different in other locations, such as in California, where you have a lot of winter precipitation. Um, there's not as much snow in this particular location, um, but then that winter precipitation coupled with the dry summer leads to a lot of predictability um, going out starting in March and April, because you don't have a lot of uncertainty in meteorological drivers going forward. In any case, these dynamics are what we tried to pick up in this, this uh, error attribution framework. Um, and so for instance, if you compare the error in the forecast at different lead times, and this is for different forecasts made at different times of the year, October, um, January, April, and July, each line is sort of starting where the forecast starts. Um, this shows the ratio of the error in a, from a dip, from a, from one of the sources. So blue is the initial condition source, red is the, uh, the forcing source or climate forecast source. You can see that their influence on the overall uh, uncertainty in the forecast varies greatly throughout the season. So in the beginning of the year, for instance, climate forecasts are much more important than initial conditions. This is the beginning of the water year. Um, that's because you're going into the rainy season and the initial conditions are likely a dry soil moisture. And so the hydrologic variability is gonna be determined by the, whether you have a, a very rainy winter or a slightly rainy winter. Um, whereas down in the, the Rio Grande in Southern Colorado, um, you start the year with initial conditions being much more important than climate forecast. So the basic point of this is this, to show that this error attribution for, uh, framework can tell you a lot about how important seasonal climate forecasts are for a stream flow forecast or runoff forecast compared to the land surface. And this is useful because that can help tell you something about, if you look at it over the whole country, uh, the elasticity of runoff forecast skill compared to uh, climate forecast skill or initial condition forecast skill. So this is on the left, flow forecast um, related to climate forecast skill and this on the right, flow forecast skill related to initial condition skill. And basically these elasticities would show you, for instance, that if you're initializing on October 1, in the East Coast, um, the climate forecast still is very important. And that's actually true most of the time, except as you get into summer. And then if you're initializing on October 1, this climate, this initial condition skill in the in the high mountain western US is very important. And so if you're a management agency, you might think about the forecasts that are important to you and and what kinds of techniques for improving them or new data or new development work is going to be most beneficial. Um, so in any case, this kind of attribution framework is now being widely used uh, in hydrologic predictability studies, uh, US, Europe, Canada. Um, there have been a number of papers that follow the same ESP reverse ESP way of uh, attributing forecast skill to different drivers. Um, this is just an example of a global analysis 
um, showing the same sort of ratio concept being used to separate out places where initial conditions versus driving climate forecast um, influence skill the most strongly. Um, it's a paper by Shred Shukla, who used to be a, a PhD student of mine uh, when I was doing this predictability work initially. Um, so with those thoughts in mind about where predictability comes from for hydrology, um, it's worth recognizing, or maybe it gives us a way to understand why there are actually many ways that people around the world are making uh, hydrologic S2S forecasts. Um, the simplest of these is just to use empirical techniques. You basically have a statistical or empirical, or it could be nowadays machine learning model, where you relate broad scale climate indices uh, to stream flow. And actually, probably shouldn't have runoff here, but sometimes runoff is also used as part of this um, without any sort of land modeling involved. Um, and I could just show a quick example of why that works um, from a long time ago, uh, so 1999 or so, and, and in the 90s when people were exploring the impact of teleconnections such as Pacific Decadal Oscillation or, or El Nino, and so uh, on land, uh, North American climate and, and continental, I guess, climate for many continents. Um, we we're also looking at how that influenced stream flow, and you could find that just knowing the PDO or the, the ENSO state could tell you something about your likelihood of getting above average or below average stream flow. And this is a basin in the Pacific Northwest, um, a paper by my colleague, Alan Hamlet. Um, so that it was very easy to get some sort of broad predictability out of just paying attention to these indices and then statistically relating them through composites or, or resampling or regression models to the, the outcome for a stream flow. Um, more recently, there have been a move toward dynamical forecasts, and there's quite a large community that would like to basically be able to take uh, dynamical stream flow forecasts directly from global climate models or global NWP models, which would be very convenient. You don't then have to run any kind of separate hydrology model or even have separate hydrology staffers you just you know that are doing their own thing with their own model and have their own needs and budget you can just run your nwp system and pull out runoff and then usually have to route it through some sort of channel stream flow channel routing model to produce the stream flow but this will be an example of a fully dynamical approach to generating stream flow and i'll show an example of this later um, another probably more common dynamical way. In fact, this is probably the most common dynamical uh, uh, strategy that's being pushed, uh, particularly in Europe where you have ECMWF being quite a, a dominant and influential source of skillful climate forecasts would be to take climate fields from the coupled GCM forecast and then you downscale them and you use weather generation techniques to generate local meteorological fields to drive a hydrology model to produce runoff to run through a channel routing model to produce stream flow. So this is, you know, in this case, there could be some sort of statistical empirical components within the downscaling, but in general, it's based on dynamical model, running dynamical models. It's quite computationally expensive. Um, there's certainly more hybrid um, approaches that combine elements of both of these. You know, sometimes you use uh, use reanalysis fields or indices or GCM outputs, and then have some statistical model relating it to stream flow. You could also have this kind of dynamical approach, and then the two are generating separate stream flow approaches that can be merged through techniques like Bayesian model averaging to produce kind of posterior um, predictions for stream flow that harness the strengths of both empirical and dynamical. Um, there's also traditional kind of incremental approaches that I would say build off the standard ESP approach I talked about before, where you use a hydrology and land model plus routing to produce stream flow. But then you go in and you condition that stream flow ensemble forecast that you get using climate information that could come from 
a number of sources. It could come from GCM forecasts, climate indices, or analysis fields um, that are identified as being predictive for your region. And then you have a sort of post-process streamflow ensemble. Um, this is something we're looking at right now in, in this uh, tutorial with the Hydro Group. Um, in any case, there are many people trying to kind of slice this, this pie in a different way. Uh, and by and large, the, these don't have the same levels of success. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit about um, why, in general, I, I guess I would say the MOP, the approaches that use hydrology and land models uh, tend to be more successful. Um, I, I should say that one other thing that's been we've been doing um, in the hydrology area is trying to make climate forecasts more accessible to groups that are focused on watersheds and water management and hydrology and hydrology modeling. Um, so in this kind of a project, we do with a variety of different post-processing te techniques and some spatial translation techniques to basically process available forecasts into watershed scale predict ands, which are more familiar to water managers and water management groups. Um, they have they tend to have climatologies that are more recognizable um, versus the kind of coarse scale climate products that are not not more not the sectorally not tailored to sectors like this. Um, so this is an example of a system we stood up about four or five years ago to use NMME forecasts and CFS forecasts. Um, and just to go quickly through this, I don't want to make this a major part of the presentation, but in this kind of a system, you can look at the skill of um, forecasts from different sources at um, lead times and for sort of prediction areas that make sense to the water managers and the hydrologists. And you can even go in and through post-processing, um, find ways to enhance that skill. It's very difficult, certainly for precipitation, like in the week three, four period. Um, in this case, we do some conditioning of the uh, CFS version two climate forecasts using other fields from the CFS version two predictions, such as SSTs. And then when we combine these in a kind of component-based regression, we can definitely improve temperature forecasts, um, but it's more challenging for precipitation forecasts. When we apply these kinds of approaches, we can, again, at this watershed scale, actually improve forecasts in places and at times, but certainly not everywhere. This was kind of a, you know, it, it was a limited scope study, but the point was to show that um, even at this watershed scale, some of this post-processing could be helpful in enhancing skill. And hopefully some of the other groups that are working in this with machine learning in this um, ASP colloquium will be finding similar outcomes. So, that, so sorry, all these areas that are in yellow and red and orange are places where we improve skills through this post-processing. So getting back to an example, another example of this sort of traditional empirical um, development of S2S hydrology forecast, um, I'll just show an example of some work that we did recently with uh, the Bureau of Reclamation, the Upper Colorado River Basin, which is here. Um, this shows an example of a typical product from uh, the, our national centers for an NMME forecast of precipitation. It's very coarse scale, you know, boundaries where it's pretty hard to pick out the actual watershed, which looks like this. Um, again, talking about hydrologists and water managers, we tend to think in terms of these basins. Uh, in these drainage areas that go into major reservoirs. Um, and as we're, it's especially important right now that we're hitting this really critical drought. I don't know if people have been paying attention to the news, but these big reservoirs for the system, like Lake Powell and Lake Mead, are now at historical lows. In any case, here we took again this traditional approach where we generated ensemble predictions um, using an ESP forecast approach. And then once we had those ensemble predictions, we looked at 
the current forecast and looked at analogs within the meteorological drivers of our ensemble predictions and then gave those analogs that matched our current prediction higher weights so that we could then impose the climate forecast signal onto this um, unweighted uh, ensemble forecast driven by historical climate. And we did it in different ways. We looked at climate information over this entire river basin, which you can see spans multiple states. We also looked at it in a more granular fashion, breaking out certain areas where you might anticipate you have a gradient of forecast um, outcomes. You know, you could be forecasting it's going to be drier in the San Juan River Basin to the south and wetter in the Green River Basin to the north. So there's maybe some argument that, that you should be trying to harness those gradients when you do this kind of thing. And as I showed before, by and large, we found that imposing climate information in this way, uh, and this is showing the skill score of CRPSS, um, over, and these are forecasts of runoff volumes uh, starting in summer and going out to June, where the, the predict and is basically the, um, uh, the runoff volume, I think it's from April through July, and basically find that these methods called KNN, these analog methods, they use climate information, do by and large reduce the error in the forecast. So that's a successful demonstration of um, forecast using forecast information from climate models like NMME um, to benefit hydrologic prediction skill. Um, I want to switch now to talking a bit about global systems and uh, and what's possible and what's being done on the global level to do hydrologic predictions. Um, there are a number of centers, ECMWF, uh, Swedish Met and Hydro Institute, um, Del, that's in Sweden, Deltaris in Holland, um, and other groups around the world that are doing, uh, they're starting to pay attention to hydrologic outputs from their global prediction systems. Um, the most credible of these, as I mentioned before, involve uncoupled land surface simulations or driven by climate outcomes from global hydrology models. So example of this is the SMHI Worldwide Hype Model, um, which is forced by ECNWF reanalyses and forecasts. Um, there are also these fully coupled systems in which the land model is, is being developed but is basically putting out runoff that's being routed into um, to stream flow locations and assessed. Um, I think the goal there in this development is that if we start to pay attention to this hydrology, um, we will eventually develop and improve a source of predictability in the land surface that could benefit numerical weather prediction. Um, so it's kind of an indirect way of eventually getting better weather and climate forecasts as well as hydrology forecasts. Um, from this batch of efforts, let's say the least credible outcomes, unfortunately are still the ones from these coupled forecast systems um, where the land models have never really been specifically uh, developed for hydro hydrologic prediction. Um, and, and here I'm just gonna show some examples of these types of efforts, which often have quite nice websites where you can go and look at um, Predictions, this one is from SMHI, um, showing a sort of monthly mean river flow. And um, SMHI's land models are implemented on a catchment basis, so they're not gridded. You can often see different catchments in this, in this pattern, the spatial patterns. Um, the ECM WF coupled system approach um, is basically to run their IFS, their integrated forecasting scheme. Um, uh, and then take the runoff and route it through a model called list flood to produce global forecasts, um, the global stream flow forecasts and do some post-processing to turn it into uh, alert, alerts and warnings and other kinds of usable information products. Uh, we had a nice talk from Rebecca Emerton uh, last week who helped develop the seasonal side of this global flood awareness system, GLOFAST. Um, before it had been used for medium range prediction. And uh, here's just an example screenshot from this product, which is on the web. You can go and access it and query it. Um, if you, I think you have to make a 
uh, free registration, but aside from that, the products are free. Um, but definitely there is this attempt to do a kind of global sub-seasonal to seasonal hydrologic prediction that's being picked up um, by agencies like ECMWF. Here's another example. If you drill into this GLOFAST system and you click on a, on a reporting point where they're, they're highlighting a forecast, perhaps because something is happening there and seeing the kind of plumes um, for river flow going out, they're again being generated by this, this coupled land scheme. And then various alert oriented products where they show risk in different time periods across the sequence of forecasts. Um, and then nice thing about what's being done, I would say this work is, which started back in around 2012 to put this together has reached the point where skill assessments are being published. And you can see that there's um, both good and bad in these skill assessments. Certainly there are a lot of locations where there is no skill if you look at a skill score like the rock. Um, and then there are places where the, there's much higher skill. Um, this is kind of to be uh, expected. Um, another nice thing about the, these efforts is that they're starting to go beyond just forecasting to generating all the other kinds of products that are needed to understand the forecast. So reforecast and reanalyses that, that you can go back and used to do skill assessments. And the systems are becoming quite, I guess, elaborate. And one notable thing to say about um, <clears throat> this GLOFAST system is that although it started with a coupled land scheme, they have now moved to um, spinning up an uncoupled global land scheme because they recognize the need to calibrate and improve the land um, component of the forecast, there needs to be more control over how the land surface is responding so that they can improve the quality of the forecast. So that's, in a way, it's kind of a recognition that we're not quite there on the use of runoff directly from coupled forecasting models, such as the ones in our S2S database. Um, there's a lot of hope that we will get there through model development. I think probably the next speaker, Paul Dermeyer, will talk a bit about what's being done to improve land surface um, performance um, and, and understand the predictability there. So um, I hope Andy, to Sorry to interrupt, a couple of more minutes. Okay. Thanks. So I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll just say that we're trying to use these in, um, in a new system that's being set up by the World Meteorological Organization. So this is a combination of coupled and uncoupled approaches. Um, so I will just say one thing uh, here. It's, this is a slightly different angle taken from the long range projection, uh, hydrologic projections. There's an increasing trend to start to use hydrology from um, not just S2S, but decadal and multi-decadal or century scale projections. And I just want to point out perhaps why we're in this situation where our land models don't automatically give us good results when we take the runoff from them. Um, certainly there are a lot of reasons related to scale and the ability to resolve physical processes. I mean, these models are run at very large scales that don't necessarily resolve the features of, of watersheds, including their terrain. But in addition, the way that we evaluate land models in coupled earth system models or GCMs is as just a small fraction for hydrology amidst all the different other factors that we're trying to evaluate, such as atmosphere, radiation energy cycle, carbon cycle, um, and, and other things. So that in the end, we may only be looking at runoff as a, just one small piece of the big picture. And as a result, it is going to be very hard to tailor it and improve it in a way that makes, makes us sure that we'll get reliable results. So, with that, um, I won't spend too much time, but just give some final thoughts. Um, there are multiple, the main takeaways I'd like people to have is that there are multiple paths for creating S2S hydrologic predictions. Um, it's really critically important to recognize the role of the land surface on forecast skill, that just because a global model or a coupled ESM has 
runoff in hydrologic fields, they may not be high quality. Um, and until we improve this land surface hydrology, our most usable forecasts are coming from these kind of uncoupled, calibrated land models driven by climate information. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop. Um, hopefully this can help us bring our communities together um, so that the hydrologists and water manager type people like myself are more in communication with climate developers like many of those in this um, symposium. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thanks for a very comprehensive talk. Um, Thank you.